Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is part of the Open Publishing Fest, and we have assembled a lot of people here um, to weigh in on a topic of writing manuscripts on GitHub. We'll be discussing whether automated software can replace publishers. And I know that's a provocative title, but I, I'm hoping to get some interesting feedback from the participants today. So without further ado, I'd like to go around and have everyone uh, introduce themselves. And uh, each participant will give their name, a brief introduction, and what their relation to this topic is. So um, first up is Haley Rando. Hi, I'm Haley Rando. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in Casey Green's lab um, with Daniel. And I'm currently working on a COVID-19 review of diagnostics and therapeutics using Manubot. And so it's written for a general scientific audience and it's written by a general scientific community. So most of our contributors come from non-computational backgrounds. So it's been an interesting process working with people to uh, adapt to these tools that make open publishing possible. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Would you like to speak now? I'm Anthony Gitter. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Morgridge Institute. And my involvement has been through the Manubot tool, initially working on a deep learning review with Daniel and Casey. And now we've been using Manubot for much more general manuscripts, including the COVID-19 review that Haley's leading. Uh, Eric, your turn. Hi, I'm Eric Hellman. <clears throat> um, I sometimes tell people that I'm the most, most prolific GitHub user on the planet um, uh, because I have uh, published over 60,000 books uh, from Project Gutenberg onto GitHub using uh, in, as part of the Gutenberg project. Uh, all of, we have a lot of infrastructure around that. And I'm working with Project Gutenberg now to implement that into their production um, cycle, production and, and maintenance cycle. Um, I also uh, run one of the top 10 uh, GitHub repos on, um, well, on GitHub, uh, the, the free programming books repo, uh, which, uh, uh, list, it's just a list of free programming books, uh, over 3,000 resources, and uh, we've had over 1,200 contributors. Um, as part of that, I checked, there are about uh, 400 free programming books uh, which are hosted in some way on GitHub. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Lexi. Yep, hello. Uh, my name is Alexei Savin, and I'm the founder of Referit. We are a Finland-based startup, and Referit is a platform for scientific, collaborative scientific writing, interactive peer review, and open access publishing, uh, and also have an uh, academic background in space research. So my interest in this discussion uh, is that uh, we also plan to introduce version control into our application, and I would like to know, like, uh, what are the processes and workflows that you are using in Monobot? So maybe we will implement something similar with the, with the Git repository setup. Casey. So I'm a computational biologist at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, my lab primarily focuses at the intersection of really machine learning and genomics. Um, I guess, why am I interested in uh, this type of publishing? So in terms of research, my group's written a lot of papers. Uh, I'd like to write fewer papers, but have more versions of them. So essentially, I like the idea of a living literature where you know it's a resource that you can go to to receive an up-to-date view of you know what the contemporary science is and what the contemporary science says around a topic. And so I see this as a way to enable that. And so that's what gets me excited. Vince. Hello. Um, so I am a front-end uh, software developer in, on, in the Green Lab. And um, I am basically responsible for the, the sort of front-facing part of the Manubot tool, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, so if any questions come up in this 
um, this talk about the front end uh, features, like how it behaves or how it looks. Uh, I'll be here to, to hopefully answer some of those. Great, and Vince is also um, helping with um, some technical stuff and we'll be posting comments from the YouTube live stream uh, into the Jitsi chat. So hopefully if you have any questions and you're a viewer, uh, put them in that YouTube chat and at some point we'll get around to answering them. Yes. Uh, next, uh, Arfan. Hi there, uh, my name is Alvon Smith. I uh, run a project called the Journal of Open Source Software, which is a uh, open access journal that runs uh, on GitHub um, for peer review and for all the hosting of the manuscripts. And our submissions are uh, Git repositories that include a short markdown paper and those get compiled with a with a robot called Whedon um, that sort of assists the whole editorial process. So um, that's my sort of uh, side project, side hustle. And uh, in my day job, I uh, run a uh, organizational unit called the Data Science Mission Office at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, and we run the Hubble Space Telescope amongst other uh, missions for NASA. So. Great, uh, Olga. Great, uh, thanks Daniel for organizing this. Um, so I am Olga Botvinnik. I am a data scientist at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub uh, in San Francisco. Um, my connection to this is that I started writing a paper last fall and uh, started in um, Overleaf, started in one platform or another, and really just uh, wanted a, something that was uh, open and my collaborators could easily contribute to. And I also just got really tired of, of publication like bibli bibliography management. So uh, I started using Menobot and posting issues, running into problems, uh, and fixing them in some cases with one line changes. Uh, so uh, that's how I became involved. And um, I really like what uh, Casey said about having a living document, because I think um, yeah, updating your manuscript to be the latest version as opposed to just having many of basically the same uh, paper, it, I think is a really interesting um, way to move science forward. Great. Uh, so that's everyone besides me. I'm Daniel Himmelstein. I'm currently a postdoc in uh, Casey's lab at University of Pennsylvania. And um, I've been working on developing Manubot for a few years now, uh, uh, making a tool for people to write their manuscripts on GitHub. So I'm really excited for this discussion. And th the discussion, I don't think will focus too much on any one tool, although you know people will be mentioning uh, the great work they've done here. But uh, just in general where the field is moving and how we can change publishing. So uh, let's start off with the first question. And that will uh, be, what makes authoring or publishing via Git repositories different than traditional scholar, scholarly publishing? And, and for this question, let's actually consider traditional scholarly publishing to include journals as well as preprint servers. Um, I know not everyone may think they're traditional, but uh, kind of what we're talking about is publishing um, where the users are using a, a piece of software called Git to track uh, either the version and, and the website GitHub to uh, collaborate and, and give an online location for that paper. Um, so let's see, Haley, uh, what makes this different? So, um, I'm currently writing two papers, one for my previous postdoc position and then the COVID-19 review. So one has about 20 collaborators, all of whom are wildlife biologists, and then me, <laughs> um, who was kind of previously at the intersection of computational biology and wildlife biology. And then the COVID-19 review is people all over the world from a, many, many, many different fields. The challenges that we run into with the more traditional paper um, is that, for example, if I send a draft to my the other grad students in California that are working on it and I don't hear back from them, I then have this, this serious conflict of um, you know, integrating the changes that they want with the changes that people are making on our side that everyone's familiar with. But on the COVID-19 review, the challenge is actually just working with biologists who don't have a computational background to try to get them comfortable with the platform 
but it's much, much easier to integrate their ideas. So it's definitely more of a dynamic process. It's definitely more, um, I think it's ultimately a better use of time because they're developing a skill and instead of kind of redoing things, everything is getting added as it gets added. So that's the main difference that I've encountered. Great, thanks. Uh, Anthony, do you wanna focus on, on one thing? Yeah, so one main difference I see is that having the manuscript source hosted on GitHub sends a signal and an invitation for other people to join in and contribute. And there's varying degrees of that. Uh, with Manubot manuscripts, that's gone all the way to inviting new strangers to contribute as primary authors of a manuscript, but also an invitation to make typo fixes and small corrections and just help somebody else polish their projects. So that's been one of my favorite aspects. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So, Eric, how are your um, Gittenberg ebooks different than a, a traditional book? Um, so, the thing that makes um, GitHub different, as we all know, is the ability to fork, to change something and make it your own. Uh, with public domain material, um, it, it's sort of easy. It's been being done for you know hundreds of years, uh, but now it can be now it's it's become industrialized. Uh, so it's important for publishers to take the lead in in making their documents live rather than uh, sitting dead on a shelf. Great, thank you, um, Alexei. Uh, yeah, I think the, the main difference is that uh, GitHub can serve as a central source of truth during the write, during writing uh, process of writing the paper, and so that you can be sure that uh, people who collaborate on the paper they they're not working on their own versions and there are no conflicts when merging their changes. And also, I liked what uh, what also uh, the idea that uh, you can quickly get get your ideas uh, into the public domain and maybe somebody will join and collaborate on, on, on your work so it gets to public quicker. Thanks, Casey. Can I, can I ask a question to Eric, actually? Is that OK? Sure. Uh, what kinds of changes do people make to the uh, public domain works? In my mind, they're all like finished projects that are untouched for years. Like, What kinds of things do people add to them? And how are they live? Uh, so, in a collection of 60,000 books, uh, there are a very tiny, small percentage of uh, errors there. But you multiply it by 60,000, and there's still a lot. So, uh, Project Gutenberg didn't ever have a real uh, good mechanism for fixing mistakes. And so, when we first uh, put stuff up on GitHub, uh, we get an occasional uh, comment that, oh, there's a page missing in this book. Yeah, and so we were able to fix it. Now I'm uh, sort of much more involved in the inner workings of Project Gutenberg. And, and you know, there's, there's uh, 40 years worth of public domain books. And uh, it's pretty amazing to me that the, the old stuff uh, still compiles into into EPUBs and Mobies, um, but uh, you know there, there's a lot of stuff there that um, uh, needs needs cleanup, and uh, without a you, you know a software pipeline uh, that builds and checks all these books, you're not going to find out where the problems are. Thanks for that. Fascinating. Uh, so in general, we'll have kind of questions after each round. Um, but thank you. That was, that was such a good question. I couldn't stop it. Now, uh, Casey, uh, what's what's one of the best aspects here? Well, I think the, you know, what I find most valuable is that the way we write on GitHub and sort of incremental addition, subtraction, modification, uh, aligns really well with you know how we kind of mentally craft manuscripts. I know like 
much of sort of the mental crafting of manuscripts that I do is sort of thinking about framing and thinking about the results and where things fit. And that happens, you know, in conversations with other people. Um, moving that to GitHub gives us a way to do that that's, you know, includes some in-person conversations, but it's also kind of disconnected from that. And so it's kind of a nice way to move to, you know, a world that's maybe a little bit less dependent on sort of happenstance meetings at conferences to drive things forward and maybe more dependent on happenstance meetings on GitHub. Cool, uh, Arfan. Yeah, I was, I, I really uh, like Casey's comment there. I think I was gonna say the platform is the, the, the kind of killer feature. For me, that's both in how humans interact, um, you know, making the process of writing documents more like open source projects work, I think is, you know, this sort of asynchronous way of working where you make your change and then somebody comes and kind of works and reviews that later. I think that's good for lots of academic collaborations. Um, the other, and sort of to build on that, the point about using a platform is that every time somebody does something, that because it's a, a platform you can build against, and this is kind of how uh, journal open source software works, there's you know events coming out of the API that you can do things with, and so how how is the platform? How is it better in some ways? It's, you can you can build on top of the um, respond to the actions of authors, and you can actually build whole workflows around that, and that turns out to be incredibly powerful. Um, and really breaks us away from this model of sort of, I finish my manuscript, I submit it to somebody, and then I get an email telling me here are some comments six months later. Like it, it just kind of breaks open the whole, the whole kind of um, flow of publishing, which I think is very powerful and actually means you can build better services that you can get than you can get from a, from a closed, closed system. Thanks, uh, Olga. Sure, I think uh, Alexei and uh, ha Haley mentioned this, but having a single source of truth uh, and a very transparent way. Um, one thing I really like is that I can I'm so, tell someone I'm writing a paper and then send them the link for the paper in progress uh, as it's going on before, you know, before it's uh, really published and live. Because I think uh, ultimately the goal is to share information as uh, quickly as possible. So then, for me, like as a methods tool developer, computational biologist, uh, I want people to use the tool, but I have this cool idea, but then I don't really know what it applies to. So then if people can see, hey, like I see what you're doing here. And like, if you flipped it this way, then it would be really useful for me. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like that's good to know that that direction is more useful than what I was doing. So being able to share that result early on and that concept early on really helps to, um, for me, course correct the research into something that will will be useful. That's a great point. Um, yeah, what really resonates with me is sometimes you send someone a link to like a manuscript, and, and you may may they may not look at it for two weeks, and you may have made additional changes. So if you were just attaching a PDF um, or you know saying a traditional journal article, they would get the version when you wrote that email or sent it, or when you put it in your CV. Uh, whereas now you can give someone a link to your future work, uh, which is cool. Uh, so I think for me, the best thing about um, workflows that, that publish or author through GitHub is changing a default. And we all know how powerful a default can be. And the default here is defaulting to open. Um, so you could still do some things privately if, if you were writing a manuscript on GitHub. For example, you could have... Um, communication offline, but in general, um, people switch their behaviors to having, say, discussions between the co-authors online or discussions about uh, why a section should be the way it is or about a certain result. And all of those discussions and additional openness that um, tends to happen on um, GitHub, I think really enriches the scientific record. And uh, so me, that that's the, the best part. Now, for the next question, I want to talk about the worst parts. Um, so I guess um, at, at this point, not everyone has to. Oh, before we talk about the worst parts, did anyone want to say anything uh, about people's comments during this first session? Eric? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to to mention, you know, as part of the the, the things that have changed with with uh, doing things on GitHub, 
the most important thing is the social practice that has developed and is has become internalized by 20 million people. Um, it's really hard, especially for software developers, to understand that programming people is the most powerful thing you can do. Yeah, I agree. I agree. The culture change, I think, is the really big part. Um, Daniel, as you mentioned, just the default to open um, really takes people by surprise the first time uh, when you say, yeah, this paper is um, publicly available. You can go read it. And they're like, you're not sending me a PDF that I have to secretly not show my collaborators, but actually show them because it's so interesting. So it's, yeah, that culture change, I think, is really um, shocking to people at first because people are like, it's, I think in many scientific circles, it's, um, there, there is a perceived advantage, uh, whether it's true or not, that it is perceived to keep your uh, work close to you before sharing it. Great point. Yeah. And um, I do get that sense sometimes from people who've been in the field for a while that they're shocked by the radical openness that we're practicing. But it's so great to like mentor a new scientists and they just grow up uh, being used to this openness. And then for them, that's the norm. And um, yes, so uh, any other points before we move on to the worst aspects of <laughs> this publish on GitHub? Okay, so on this question, you, you can either uh, pass or not, but uh, Haley, do you wanna talk about the worst aspects? <laughs> Sure. So I'm from a traditional biological background. Um, I have a PhD in informatics, but before that I was in more of a traditional biology background. And there is a big gap with getting people from non-computational fields to feel empowered to work in an interface like GitHub. And um, it's kind of a, a challenge that Tony and I are <laughs> encountering every day in the COVID-19 review um, paper. But it is obviously something that it would be ideal to try to bring as much of the scientific community as possible into. Hi, Anthony. Yeah, so to build on that, I think we've seen that there's different layers of, of education or training for using Git and GitHub successfully. Uh, there's initial commands, either using Git from the command line or the, the web browser interface where you can actually change content, commit changes, then there's this next layer of how to use Git or GitHub in an effective way. And something that's come up in a lot of these big manuscripts is somebody wants to do a major refactoring and change many parts of an entire manuscript, and they've accidentally created merge conflicts for five or 10 other pull requests. It's very hard to teach somebody to anticipate that they should first wait until something's merged and then make sweeping changes. Uh, and the consequence is that maintainers end up redoing things manually as as Haley's seen. So there's a learning curve and I, I think um, yeah it, it can be challenging. Eric Yeah I, I knew what I was gonna say until I just you know wanted to respond to that thing. Uh, I, I think part of the problem um, with managing books or papers or whatever manuscripts on GitHub is uh, the, the immaturity of, of uh, some of the, the standards. Like, you know, moving, moving chapters around should, should not need to, you should not need to refactor a whole document in order to do that. And, you know, so I think there are technical issues with that. Um, but uh, to answer the, the question of what, is uh, the worst thing about uh, doing it this way is that the publishing industry that is that exists and is extremely powerful, um, you know, in a good way, um, it cannot deal with uh, versions and forks. It's it just it is so out of the box for the traditional publishing industry that um, it, it, it's, it's a big barrier to getting things 
out of GitHub and into circulation in all of the channels, including libraries that are used by most of most of academia. Great points, uh, Alexei. Uh, I agree with the previous speakers that probably the biggest problem is adoption because uh, you, people will have to learn new new ways of writing papers and probably it's 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 okay for the STEM fields but what about humanitarian fields for, for instance it will be much more difficult to get people involved into such such a way of creating papers and also I would say that probably there is a technical problem is that uh, git repositories were initially meant for uh, text materials only, and papers tip, tip, ty typically include images, media files. Maybe you would want to even include some video supplementary files or something like that. And that could be a problem, like you have to organize such kind of storage somewhere else. But probably they, that, that can be solved with, with some uh, proper software for uh, uh, front end. Yeah. Casey. Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, if we think about the extent to which platforms are open, have the tools to support participation and are inclusive, I think uh, GitHub-based publishing is open and it definitely has the tools to support participation. I worry a little bit about how inclusive it is. I think this goes to some of the comments that came up earlier, whether that it means inclusive with respect to expertise or inclusive with respect to, you know, how contributions from some contributors could be received based on, you know, implicit bias or, you know, explicit biases that exist. And so, you know, I think that is clearly an issue that occurs in all parts of science. And, you know, I want to make sure that when we think about the worst parts, we don't take the fact that it's open and that it has the tools for participation and then just assume that everyone can participate. So I think thinking about communities and how we build inclusive ones is also going to be key to make it not be the worst part. Great. Thanks, Arkham. So um, I think a lot of people have said in various ways that one of the challenges of Git and GitHub is, is Git. Uh, it's hard for people. Um, and um, I think that's a real barrier um there's one line of thinking that you know that it's a useful skill to learn but you know there are some really weird bits to get that just probably don't need to be the way they are but they just are now and we're kind of stuck with that um one thought um, that i wanted to share is that i um used to talk to a lot of people who are using github for their academic work i used to work at github and support academics and one interesting thing that came up that hasn't been said so i'll share that is that um when you have students or let's say you have the PI, so I guess Casey in this case, Casey is like, let's imagine Casey knows almost nothing about Git and all of his people who worked for him are doing all this great work and then he gets frustrated and like force pushes over the repo and just blows away everybody's work. Apparently this happens a lot, right? And so you have this, especially when you have a skills difference between people, um, you're trying to teach your boss a new technology or something. There's a, the, the actual technology can really... Um, uh, the, the, that gap can lead to some really weird interactions between people. And then you get into the kind of social dynamics of seniority within the group. So a thing that came up and, you know, the, the good news is you can prevent force pushes now on GitHub. That's a checkbox that you can turn on on the repo. But this used to be a real problem for people that that they would work really hard on something and then they're, they're, like, their boss would blow it away. And they kind of felt bad about even kind of chewing them out about that because they were so pleased that they were at least trying Git. And so there's just there's just a skills gap and challenges there that are very real, I think. And um, so I think one good solution to that is that you can do more of Git stuff in the browser these days than, than you used to be able to say, for example, five years ago. And I think that's probably a good direction for lots of projects. Cool. Sure. Um, yeah. So there's definitely the technical technical challenges with Git. And um, after this, I actually want to ask anyone if they've uh, used uh, GitHub Desktop or Kraken or any of the other GUI tools that are an intermediate between the web interface and the uh, CLI or command line interface. Uh, because I have found those to be successful for getting uh, people onboarded, um, especially in GitHub Atom. The, that tool, I 
actually prefer to use that for my commits when I do papers because it's simpler. Um, and so that's my question after this uh, my section. But um, I would say besides the technical aspect, I think culture and community is always the biggest, uh, really the biggest barrier because technical solutions can be fixed with technical technical solutions. So, uh, but the issue of a culture and the incentives in um, scientific publishing of, um, you know, having many lines on your CV uh, to get your grants and whatnot um, is an incentive to, uh, to scientists. Um, having, um, a, a, and so instead of having like one really updated review, having a having many individual reviews could could be one way of seeing that. And um, I personally see that as the biggest uh, biggest barrier is the community of science adopting. And um, as Casey mentioned, who can actually use it? Because uh, ultimately, yeah, you can't just like create something and say like, oh, it's so great, people can use it. But um, making sure that people are trained, that they feel supported and being able to use it and feel that they can and are empowered to do it um, is its own challenge. Definitely, I guess let's let uh, anyone who wants to answer your question about um, alternative, I guess, interfaces for Git or, or um, tools. I use a GitHub desktop almost, almost exclusively. And I think one of the benefits of of the command line interfaces uh, weirdness is that it prevents people from using it. <laughs> so I will, um, I guess what I think the worst part is, is that there are potentially technical barriers or just things that require thought before you can start writing. Uh, so obviously writing scholarly content is very challenging and if you're in the right you know, mental framework to do that, you don't want anything getting in your way, uh, especially not technical barriers. And um, at least with Manubot now, if you're setting up a new manuscript or uh, say you even wanna make a new pull request, there's a little bit of friction um, before you can really start you know, typing. So I think lowering that um, w would help uh, tools like this appeal to people. Uh, so now, does anyone want to make any more comments before we move on to the next question? Uh, Daniel, just to, to note, we have a question from YouTube, if you want to take a look at that. Okay, so here we have the YouTube question, and um, sorry, I don't know the author, but um, are you considering authors publishing in own repos or in repos owned by an organization or community. If author owns the repository, they can and have to moderate uh, issues, reviews, contr contributions, which doesn't seem ideal. Um, anyone want to answer that question? Go, go ahead. So I was just going to say for Joss, we um, people submit their own repository, which includes which is their software and a paper, um, and we 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 like it that way. We don't want to try and sort of curate repositories, um, but I know that other projects like our OpenSci, um, they they go through a review process. They're not; it's kind of more software review, but rather than paper review, but still it's sort of related to this subject. I think. And as part of that process, you're sort of contributing your project to the R Open Side project. So they do actually bring it into the R Open Side GitHub organization. So I think there's a few different ways of doing that. Um, my view on this is mostly very software oriented. I think for a, a strict journal, I think you could imagine that the, the software, the paper that had the, the repository that had the paper might end up eventually within the journals organization or something because they're taking some responsibility but I, I think it kind of depends what you're trying to do uh yeah thanks ram ram for that question uh i'd like to echo um what arfon said and i i think there's a lot of options for how you set this up it could be on your own personal repository it could be in an organization and you can use whatever setup um 
fits your use case the best. So for example, if we're writing a paper for the Green Lab, we would put that in a Green Lab repository. Um, and you know maybe the Green Lab has certain policies like that uh, the repositories have issues and pull requests. Uh, whereas maybe if I wanted to make a personal repository that disabled all of that stuff, which I don't do, but, but I could if I wanted to. Uh, so, so there's flexibility there. So um, we have about 20 minutes left. And uh, kind of one question that not everyone has to answer, but um, as the world shifts to open access, there's the question of how do we pay for it? And a lot of um, open access journals charge article processing charges that can be quite hefty, uh, maybe even 2,000, 3,000, even up to 5,000 US dollars. And uh, one problem with that is it could exclude uh, certain scholars or, or labs from publishing potentially. And it begs the question, why does publishing need to be so expensive? So um, are there big cost efficiency gains to be had uh, from publishing models on sites like GitHub? And um, does anyone know some, some figures? Arfan. So I can speak for the costs of the Journal of Open Source Software. We've written a blog post about this, which maybe we could link to in the, in the notes or something. Um, the, um, there are, I think, substantial cost gains that can be made. Um, some of those are a result of automating parts of the editorial process, which has been a lot of our focus with Joss. Um, part of it is also um, if you can get together a volunteer collection of people to work as your editorial team. And I recognize that just that statement in itself is, you know, there's real work there and people are donating time. And that's a, especially a barrier for some people I recognize. But, um, you know, Review is generally not paid for by journals, by any journals, um, and uh, some editors get paid. Um, most journals won't tell you how much they pay their editors because they don't. That's commercially sensitive information, and it's often a relatively small stipend. So we wrote a blog post exploring this. There are some fixed costs for something like Joss, which are sort of DOIs are not free. Um, DOIs cost money. Um, running a you know a web application on something like Heroku costs money, but we worked out that the the actual fixed costs that we have to pay that we cannot get out of uh, bring a Joss paper in at about three dollars per paper, um, and uh, if we paid people um, stipends, um, we we could easily get ourselves up to two or three hundred dollars per paper. Um, we avoid some of the biggest costs, though, and I think tools like Manubot uh, encourage this as well, in the sense that we don't offer copy editing for authors. We tell authors that that's their job. Um, and so, you know, a large part of what I think journals, some I think journals have some very real costs, and that's partly about um, profit. And it's partly about what authors expect of them and on the what authors expect. I think people often expect you help with copy editing, that kind of thing. And we just don't we don't do any of that. We try and avoid all of that. And so I think um, the interesting thing is to look at where the real fixed costs are, where the author value is. And, and you know, running a peer review system based on volunteer effort, um, which is like most journals anyway, um, you can get down to very, very low costs. Um, and I'd be happy to say more if you want to know specifics. Any other cost comments? Um, around that, uh, that blog post that you uh, were talking about, I did link in the, in the chat, I believe. I think I got the right one. Yeah. You did. I just copied it there as well. Sorry, I, didn't, I missed that. Yep. Great. So let's go to another audience question by Robin. Uh, much of academic writing will still be published via journals and thus be constrained by specific layouts, uh, styles, et cetera. How far can and should tools like um, Manubot cater uh, to those requirements? Anthony, do you have uh, something you want to say here? Yes, yeah, so I guess I have, I have two views. And 
in the longer term, and, and part of this discussion is about publishing with GitHub, not just writing. So on the publishing side, then uh, there's really no constraints. Then I, I think that at least in Manubot, we see more interactive HTML formats as being the ideal, and uh, we shouldn't really feel the need to conform to layouts that have been used for PDF-based publishing of, of the current times. So I'd like to keep moving in that direction. In our practical experience, just writing Manubot manuscripts that do end up being uh, submitted to traditional journals. And so far, uh, we found that most publishers want something like a Word doc or LaTeX source files, and that uh, they haven't really been too strict about requiring templates. So again, Manubot's been more content focused and presenting that content in an appealing way that's HTML centric uh, and have a way to deliver the content to a traditional publisher if that's the current goal. Um, Daniel, I, I can maybe add something a little bit more of a finer point, uh, less of a broad point, but regarding the HTML view, um, the, the stuff that we've developed for Manubot, um, I, th I think that it's possibly the, the first impression uh, that people might get, especially people coming from traditional academia, might be that these features are sort of just gimmicks and, and uh, just like nice little things to have. Uh, and maybe I'm a little bit biased since I'm the one who wrote the front end features, but I really do believe that these, these things like tool tips and jumping between citations can actually enhance um, understanding, like how, how you understand the material and how quickly you're able to, to digest it. And even little things that you might not think about, like accessibility, um, people who are hard of sight or, or who don't have uh, uh, fine motor control skills and can only use the keyboard and things like that. Um, so it, you know, I, I just want to impress upon people that it's, it's not just a gimmick and that it actually has like concrete, um, tangible value. Thanks for that. And I, yeah, I don't think they're gimmicks, but there's also a concept of, of death by a thousand gimmicks, whereby you know the journals are just a little bit worse at, at thousands of things that really add up um, in, in the whole experience of publishing there and, and reading papers there. Uh, Eric, do you have something to say? Yeah, I just want to give a perspective from someone who's been doing this for 20 years. Uh, the the ac academic publishing would be all open source now. Uh, except for one major obstacle. And that obstacle is Microsoft Word. And the reason is because uh, authors in this area are very creative and they use all the features of Microsoft Word or whatever tool they're using uh, to enhance the look of their, their, uh, their paper. Uh, but all of that enhancement that they do makes it harder uh, to, to convert their content into a formatted publication. Uh, and so if you stripped away the, the ability of authors to do sort of uh, presentation front end things, uh, you would strip out about 90% of the production cost of journals. Uh, so I, I am quite uh, opinionated about the importance of restricting the the the, uh, the 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 formatting creativity of authors if you're trying to do something open access and something that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Alexi. Uh... Uh, yes, I just wanted to add that it's a very good point that uh, uh, tools like Word to give too much too much uh, freedom for the authors to, <laughs> to to be creative about about the papers they write, and actually that's one of the reasons why we we have built the uh, our editor in a refereed in such a way that uh, it's a very opinionated editor. So it's like uh, we're using only the best practices of how you write a paper, and basically we're not we don't allow authors let, let's say to change the color or to write an abstract of like 10 paragraphs or something like that. So I, I, I guess that any any software that uh, that uh, wants to create, uh, the, to recreate the publishing process in, in, a, in, a, in a good way, have take, take into account this problem and, and actually introduce some some sort of formatting uh, uh, which which makes sense and for which the authors don't have to make much effort to, to follow this formatting. It should just happen. 
Great. So moving on to the next um, topic, and it's an interesting one. So a lot of parts of the workflows we're talking about are completely open source in terms of like the co a lot of the code of, of what we're building here is open source. But there's one thing that stands out as, as not being entirely open and being partially proprietary, and that is GitHub. And now while Git, which is tracking the versions um, and, and maintaining the history of what is going on, um, it is an open product. GitHub itself is a company that runs a website. And uh, as long as we're using GitHub, we, we are subject to some centralization risk. Is that a big problem? Are we kind of reinventing um, a, a potential dependency like we have now um, dependencies on certain uh, you know journals that don't have the community's best interests at um, heart anyone want to comment on this I guess I would say I, I definitely think it's a risk um, you know I think the git ecosystem does make it somewhat easier to construct to rapidly construct mirrors so you know, there are tools like Software Heritage and others that can help to preserve some elements of, you know, of history. Um, but I agree, you know, it's not it's not a complete solution. Um, I think it's definitely something to be to be cognizant of and sort of think about. There are also alternative platforms beyond GitHub um, that support many of these similar workflows. And you know, thinking about using those in parallel could be a a good way to reduce risk. Anyone else? Yes. So Daniel, this is Anthony. I, I feel like I should jump in here because I have a conflict of interest as a former Microsoft employee. And both Microsoft Word and GitHub are, are both central to this discussion. Uh, at, at the same time, while I have a favorable view of Microsoft, I also think it's a risk to get to GitHub centric with its closed platform. Uh, as somebody who's worked with a few Manubot projects now, I think that a lot of the extra fluff that GitHub puts on top of a bare bones workflow is what makes those project run smoothly. I'm thinking about the review interfaces, which is not a native Git feature, but it's something that's really allowed us to have discussions among authors and maintainers on, on projects. Now, more recently, we're seeing on the technical side, GitHub actions and workflows have really allowed us to, to simplify or automate even more of the the continuous integration and how manuscripts are built and deployed. So uh, those are the things that we become dependent on that are hard to replace with a, an open platform. And, and we'd need to see those features implemented by the community in, in an open platform. I think that more important is uh, that the interfaces are open, all the, all the APIs. And it's very hard to find a feature in GitHub that is not available through an API. And I think we should worry more about locking up the API than about locking up the actual software that, that runs GitHub. Because you know, the, the community um, is not something that you can replicate. Um, and at the same time, you know, the commu community can disappear if it's not properly uh, maintained and, and uh, nurtured. Uh, I would add that actually, yes, like uh, I think it's a risk to put everything on, on GitHub. Uh, mostly I'd say that uh, if you're not paying for the product, that then you are most probably the product. And in case of GitHub, it could be that uh, your materials can be used in the future for some some, some other, uh, other, other ways. <laughs> uh, but actually, I don't think that uh, that we should focus on GitHub that much. We can focus actually on the protocol itself and Git protocol can be recreated like uh, on, on any other infrastructure. And perhaps in the future, there will be some uh, sort of like Git, Git infrastructure on the blockchain, which would make such, uh, such a repository fully, uh, repository system fully uh, distributed. So that I would say that would be the perfect solution for, for publishing through Git. Definitely, and um, something like GitLab, which uh, has a large feature set that is open source, you know, could replicate a lot of what we're doing. Uh, great point, uh, though, about the community. And I think that's why we still use um, 
GitHub, the interface is nice and, and that's where everyone is hanging out socially. Um, so uh, Vince, did you want to, um, there's another yeah. audience question. Yeah. Yeah, so we have some follow-up. Uh, so uh, a couple of questions ago, we had a question from a user named Remram. Are you considering authors publishing in own repos or in repos owned by an organization community? Question uh, mark. If author owns repo, they can and have to moderate issues, reviews, contributions, um, which doesn't seem ideal. And uh, Olga asked for some clarification on what that means. Um, the the part about what uh, that it doesn't seem ideal and uh so uh, we had a response from him and remram says if the author goes unresponsive or refuses to play along it seems that the flexibility of github is not a good thing you can edit any issue or comment from anyone not quite silently there's an edited marker but very close um so i don't know if you want to address that that follow-up I, I think I, I can address it quickly. Um, I think almost it, in the worst case scenario, you get back to the current system of publication where there's no comment box on a paper, where potentially the email for the corresponding author is uh, long gone, and um, there's you know no public way of um, interacting with it or giving it feedback, and you can't contact the editor, or they the editors ignore your concerns. Um, I think in general, the norms are much better on um, GitHub. And if you know uh, people see that you don't treat comments with respect or don't respond to them on your um, manuscripts, I think that reflects on the author. And, and when things are done uh, in public, uh, people tend to, um, you know, I, I think respond in a better way. And they say sunlight is the best disinfectant for a lot of these. Um, you know, poor practices and, and scholarship and um, academia. So we are getting near the end. So I'd, I'd like to ask everyone here uh, one final question. And th there's this concept that you can have a great idea, but it can be ahead of its time. And, and if you're too ahead of the time, no matter how good that idea is, it, it may not catch on. Um, so on on that question and just on the question of you know what publishing and authoring will look like in 10 years um is this the right time and, and how far off and i'd like to go in reverse order here so um olga if you're ready would you um see see what you got on this question uh sure um uh there's there's also a question from youtube i don't know if we want to address that as well but um I, um, yeah, in, I don't know if in five or 10 years, I see all of my collaborators moving to an open uh, platform quite yet. Um, uh, the commenter on, um, on YouTube does bring up the issue of with a proprietary system that does mean that um, the content is there at will. And then if there is a problem with that content or the country the person is from, it could get taken down, which is a potential issue. Um, but, uh, as I think as much as I can try and exert influence to get people to publish openly, I do think there needs to be a larger culture change, uh, for that to be widespread. Yeah. Uh, thanks Olga. And, and thanks Vicky Steves for the question that free is not the same as open and that GitHub can take down anyone's content. And obviously, you know, it's a U.S. based company where, they potentially are forbidden by law by doing business with other countries. They can censor, you know, as any centralized service can. So um, I'll, I'll let people respond to that in, in their closing um, statements here. If you want to respond to that, uh, j just add it on. Uh, we'll continue with uh, Arfan now. Um, I think the idea of authoring more in the open and uh, is, I, I actually think it's, inevitable that we'll do more and more of this. I think this was considered, I'm thinking about like Cameron Nalen's like open lab book a decade or more ago, which just seemed crazy. And now there's quite a lot of people sort of embracing that. I, I see it as a, I don't think you go back from that model. I think we're going forward. I think the, the tide is kind of 
going in that direction. Uh, the thing I'm excited about is I actually think there are enough people active within academia who are really interested in building better publishing systems just for themselves. And I think that in another 10 years, I, I'm, I'm really interested in communities uh, taking ownership of their own journals and actually just kind of breaking the whole kind of um, dependency that we currently have on on um, on large publishing houses. Um, so I think, you know, the risk there is that anybody who does anything good gets bought by, you know, uh, Dutch companies with lots of money, for example. But so there's, there's that problem. But and I encourage you not to sell your stuff. I encourage you to keep going and get some private foundation money or something. But um, I think I think um, I think the most exciting thing for me is that this trend, I think there's an opportunity for us to really take strong ownership of a lot of what we what we need to share our work and share our ideas with our peers. And, and that's pretty exciting to me. Casey. Uh, Casey seems frozen, uh, Alexi. Uh, yes, uh, well, I don't think that the idea of publishing in, uh, in open, like on GitHub is behind, it's, it's ahead of time. I actually would say that it's behind the time. It's it's already we're getting already too late, because uh, for instance, you can see that the there is a tendency for major publishers to sign up agreements with the whole countries for the open access publishing, so that the authors don't have to pay for open access publishing because the government pays. And it seems for the authors that it becomes free, but but it's not. It's actually paid from their taxes still, and that that could be a problem because. Uh, you're losing this this argument when you are trying to persuade people to use uh, the open system because it is free because uh, like they could publish for free already in, in the journals that that could be a problem and, and in, in this regard we are already getting late <laughs> I'd like to point out we can also save them the agony of having to deal with the journal which is oftentimes many times worse than the cost but um okay let's see uh, uh, Eric. So 20 years ago, I thought that the transition to open uh, open access for scientific con content was inevitable and that would, would it happen within at most five years. And uh, I think that opinion was about 20 years ahead of its time, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, well, that puts it in now. So, Anthony. Yeah, so, in terms of timelines, you know, one that I think of is, is the rise of preprints uh, in certain fields. Archives been around since the early '90s, and I, I would say only within the past few years that we see this explosion into other fields and bioarchive. So, uh, that helps, I guess, orient my my thinking here that it might be a one to two decade very slow transition. Uh, I, I think a lot of us who have technical backgrounds can see that the technical tools are in place to make this happen. And the real limitation on the timeline could be uh, one, what Casey mentioned, making sure that these platforms and systems really are inclusive for everybody. Um, and maybe even making the new system, doing it the right way and making it better than the current system that's publisher driven. And the other uh, really helping convince authors that they will find audiences if they're taking ownership and being open and publishing on, on GitHub or whatever the alternative is in 10 years, uh, because people really want to find readers for all this hard, hard wrought effort in academia. Great, thanks. Uh, Haley. Yeah, I really agree with what Tony just said. Um, I think that it's, a lot easier to picture this happening quickly in more technical fields and in less technical fields, it's really gonna depend on education and um, making things equitable and making it clear why, the, what, the, what the pros and cons are. Um, like what Vicky said, there are certain concerns related to how this could introduce different types of um, issues with equity. And I read an interesting piece in Medium um, by Denise Albornoz about bringing feminism into open science um, where she talks about the effect on people in um, non-Western society uh, um, and trying to make equity there for them. 
So I think that as people that are invested in it, the more we can do to um, think about these issues and bring education to broader fields, the quicker this will catch on. And, and like Tony said, the more it will kind of change the power distribution in publishing. Great. Uh, thanks, everyone. So uh, I guess I'll just give my closing thoughts here. Um, we may be ahead of our time. We may not. But I think everyone who's joined today uh, is a trailblazer in this regard. And we are showing what a better system of publishing could be like. And um, even if our specific tools you know, don't catch on, I, I think um, we're developing the best practices we are exploring and um, the future hopefully will be built with our experiences in mind. So thanks everyone so much for sharing. Uh, if there are any, uh, any closing thoughts that others would like to make, there is now an opportunity uh, to do that. And if you have to hop off the call because we've ran over time, uh, just exit. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wanted to just jump in. I think um, the Vicky C's comments about um, who is able to contribute is really huge. Um, it's something I, you know, was not on top of mind, but I, I appreciate her bringing that up because, um, you know, I think about um, as Haley and others have uh, mentioned the people who don't know how to use the platform and need to learn that, but that's a completely different barrier than they literally cannot use it because of some political reason. Um, and um, I do think, yeah, like we want um, as many scientists as possible contributing to science. And if that means, and if that means the platform itself we're using does not allow the contribution, like literally does not, <laughs> you are from X country, you are not allowed to contribute. That is a problem and a risk um, as, as people have mentioned about using GitHub specifically. I don't have an answer for that. I mean, there, as people have mentioned, there's many ways to decentralize already a GitHub repo, but, um, I do think that is something that um, does need to be considered in scientific publishing overall. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, um, the participants and everyone who tuned in today or will see this recording at a future time. Uh, so thank you and goodbye and have a good rest of your open publishing fest. <laughs>